So pain, it's a very common thing that we see. How many people here have ever had pain? So apparently I'm not speaking anything that's new to any of you here. Uh, and so we're not gonna be talking about anything that's new or different in any fashion. Um, but what I do wanna talk about is an experience that I had actually before I entered into PT school while I was running track in college. Uh, and I'm gonna use that to kind of explain to you how pain works a little bit. So during the track meet, I run in 800 meters and indoors, uh, it can sometimes become kind of more of a contact sport. You may not think of track and field as a contact sport, but occasionally indoors because you really don't wanna run any further than you have to, which seems kind of strange because like why are you running in the first place, right? But you don't want to go any further than you have to. So oftentimes it's very important to kind of get to the inside, but you don't want to get boxed in, and so you don't want to get too far out. And so as I'm running the race, there's the usual jostling that occurs. As I completed the race, I got done, I took my spikes off, I pulled up my nice tights, put on my warm up top, put on my training shoes, and decided to go out for a cool down run with one of my teammates. And as we're jogging on our cool down, my teammate looks at me and he says, what did you do to your leg? And I said, what do you mean what did I do to my leg? And as I quickly look down, I happened to notice that my gray tights now had a large maroon portion on the side of my leg, which I thought, that seems rather strange. I wonder what's going on there. So I reached down and pulled up my tights and I recognized real two nice long gashes down the side of my leg that instantly as I saw them had this stinging, burning pain going up and down my leg that I thought, you know what? I really think I ought to go see my trainer as I limped away. Strangely enough though, I recognized, well during the race is most likely when I got those spike marks, and yet I had no problem running the entire race and getting done, and it never once had bothered me at all as I did that. Well, so what really biologically what I have found out now, what actually happens during this process is when I got touched on the outside of the leg with uh, the spikes, there was a set of neurons that got fired up uh, that they instantly sent a message up towards my spinal cord that most likely told me you're being touched on the outside of your leg. As that information entered into my spinal cord, it crossed over, it rose up further up in towards uh, my brainstem area, and eventually crossed over, and it eventually went up to an area called the thalamus. From the thalamus then, it gets projected to multiple different areas of the brain, one of those being what we call the somatosensory cortex, which basically is a little image of your person or a representation um, of your body that sits up in your brain to tell you where you've been touched at. And another runs in through what we call the limbic system, which is really all your emotional components. And also I had other areas that most likely because it was actually a deep enough gauge, I probably had released a little bit of what we call noisiception because it was a little noxious information. That travels up some neurons that go a little bit slower, they gradually get to the spinal cord and they too eventually cross over, make their way to the thalamus and then get spread throughout the brain. All of that time that I was receiving that information, I had millions of other pieces of information entering into my brain at the same time, such as, can't you run a little bit faster? Make sure you don't get boxed in. My heart's pounding, my lungs are burning, my legs are burning, all that information is coming in. And at that moment, my brain said, you know what, I really don't think that touch on the outside of the leg is that big a deal, let's just forget about it. And that's most likely why I experienced no pain at that point in time. Obviously, once I looked down and I got a little added visual information, my brain said, you idiot, you missed something very important. We need to take care of this because obviously this potentially could get infected and that could be very such not a good thing. And I'm gonna guess something like this. How many people here have ever gotten a bruise on your body and wondered, where the heck did that come from? Okay, and so all of you, and oftentimes in life, we oftentimes think pain and injury are basically the same thing. If I get injured, I have pain. But as I've talked about in my situation, and you guys have all agreed, there's been a time where you've had injury, and yet you had no pain. Now, the op actually, the opposite occurs in other people too, as I have a picture up there, somebody who's had phantom limb pain. These are people that all of a sudden, they even don't have an arm, yet they complain of pain in their arm, which we used to think, they gotta be crazy, it's all in their head. And the reality is we could say, well, actually it is, because what's in their head is what Dr. Penfield told us many years ago is that there's that little somatosensory cortex, right? And so when you lose that arm or leg, you don't lose that portion of your brain. And so if we look at somebody with phantom limb pain, if you look at me in a nice fancy fMRI unit, what happens if I hit my thumb with a hammer? My brain lights up in a certain way and that's where I say, ow, oh, that really hurts. If you put that person with phantom limb pain in a scanner, guess what, their brain lights up in a very similar fashion and they say, ow, my thumb hurts. 
Neurobiologically, it is the exact same experience, except they have no tissue damage, yet they are experiencing pain. So we used to think, well, it's phantom, it's not real, it's just in your head. Well, no, it is real because it's a real experience, just like everything else is experienced through our brain. It actually sits within our head as far as how we experience these things. So pain is this really unique thing that oftentimes, like I said, we think pain and injury are the same thing. If I have a lot of pain, I must have a lot of injury. If I don't have much injury, I don't have much pain. But as we talked about in these two scenarios, there are times that we all talked, raised our hand and said, I've had injury and no pain. And we recognize too there's people that actually have pain, yet no injury. And that's kind of the complexity that happens with pain as we start to understand it. I oftentimes like to use an example of a car accident. Okay? A lot of times we like to point a single cause because that's what we do as human beings. We look for a very specific something to blame it on, right? Oh, you got in a car accident, you must have been driving too fast, right? It's very easy to try to point out one specific thing because it just makes life simpler and we like simple things. But often we recognize, we have to be honest, right? It's a little more complex than that. Because I'm gonna guess maybe one or two of you at some point in your life have maybe drove too fast and not gotten in a car accident, right? And so if you do get in a car accident, yes, driving fast we know is not a good thing. You're more likely to get into a car accident. But if the road condition is fine, your tar tires are good, the conditions are good, maybe hopefully you're not texting, you're paying attention, you have good skills, sometimes you can speed and not get in an accident, and sometimes you actually might not even be going the speed limit and you could get an accident. There's multiple, multiple, multiple variables involved. Pain is the same thing. It's never as simple as just an injury. And so that really brings us to the definition of pain, okay? And so the definition of pain is this idea that it's an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience. And I'm gonna stop at that point to explain this idea that pain is always sensory and emotional. A long time ago, we used to think of things being very much a sensory, like it was real, or it's, ah, you're just making it up, you're just being all emotional about it. We are at a time in history and with our scientific understanding to fully understand that pain is always both. Like I said, it's neurobiologically. Remember when I talked to it, it went to the thalamus and some of it went to the sensory cortex and some of it went to the limbic system? Neurobiologically, you cannot separate emotional and sensory components of pain. They all are part of the same experience. That's why when somebody breaks up with you or you lose a loved one, where do you hurt? It actually has a sensory location, doesn't it? When you're really hungry, there's a sensory location for it. Okay. Those pains that we feel, actually we'd say, well, that's just emotional. No, there's still a sensory component to it. No different than when I actually scraped my leg, there was a sensory component to it, but there was an emotional aspect. Pain always has this sensory and emotion. It's just neurobiological, it's how we were created. Our ability to try to separate and say, oh, you're just being too emotional, no, it's impossible. That is just biologically how we're created. The other idea that, that pain is resembling or associated with actual or potential tissue damage. Now obviously the actual tissue damage, I think we all understand that you know if you hurt yourself most likely you might feel pain, but this idea of potential tissue damage, well how does that work? Well go ahead and just if you can with me, do a little experiment, just pull your finger up in the air and just slowly pull back on your finger just a little bit until you start to feel a little discomfort and go, ah oh, that kind of hurts and hopefully you stop, right? Hopefully nobody injured themselves, if you did I hope you signed your liability form before you entered into the talk tonight. But that is the term of what we call potential tissue damage, right? How many people here think you actually damaged your finger? Yet you stopped because you said, ow, that hurts. Well, what's happening at that brief moment in time as you're loading those tendons and the receptors in the joint, they start to go, you know, this is kind of getting a little uncomfortable and I want to warn you before something really bad happens. So it's making a prediction. That's what your brains do. Your brain predicts things. Okay? And so in that situation, it's saying, I think potentially something could happen, so I wanna warn you before something really bad happens. It's very similar to hunger and thirst, right? When you get really hungry or thirsty, are you gonna die of starvation or thirst within the next second or two? Thank goodness our body builds in this little bit of a buffer zone, right? And so pain has this ability for us to sometimes create a little bit of a buffer zone to where I'm not actually causing damage even though I feel pain. And this is very important for us to help our patients understand this idea, the difference between pain and injury. Because the beauty, reality, the beauty of our body is that our body constantly has the ability to heal. Think back when you were a kid and you fell off your bike, right? You scraped up your knee. Did you have to look at it and go, geez, I hope a bunch of neutrophils, some macrophages get down there and then I'm gonna need a little extra collagen to maybe rebuild that skin up? No, how cool is that? It just does it. 
your body just heals itself on its own, right? And so we really don't even have to heal our, really do a whole lot of special, a lot of times to heal ourselves, okay? And so a lot of times when pain persists, most patients think it's must because my injury is never healed. And oftentimes that's not always the case. Oftentimes it's due to all of these other factors that are going on in an individual that make it a little bit more complex. We understand now that pain, like I said, you don't actually have to injure, it can be potential tissue damage. It can simply be this thought that it's a way to protect ourselves, so your brain is thinking that it might need to protect itself a little bit. And so in those situations, if we can help a person understand that your nervous system maybe has just become a little bit more sensitive, your alarm system has just become a little bit more active at this point in time. No different than if you're at your house and somebody breaks into your house and you probably buy uh, maybe a ring or something like that to protect your house. And if it doesn't do its job, what do you do? Do you just get something cheaper? No, you buy the Fort Knox of all security systems to really make sure you're secure. And oftentimes people that suffer with chronic pain, that's what's gone on, is their nervous system is just working a little bit too good in those situations. So all of that information, that sensory information has just been turned up the volume a little bit too high on these individuals. And that's really led us in medicine oftentimes historically is we oftentimes look at medicine purely from the injury or the biomedical standpoint. If we find it, we can fix it. And in many cases, yes, if you have a cancer or a tumor, we can cut it out. All those things work very wonderful in medicine. If there's a virus, we can find out what we need to to attack it. But when it comes to pain, it oftentimes gets a little bit more complex because it can be some of these psychological things, the trauma that the person has been through, a protective state that their nervous system might be in. It can be due to the sociological status of where they at and the struggles and the challenges they maybe have in their environment. And all of these other factors, along with some of the other biological factors that go on with them, all of these things can add together, can make it a little bit more complex. And usually as a healthcare provider, we need to get better at truly understanding our patients, not just from a biological injury standpoint, but also understanding them deeper from a psychological and social aspect because all of these things play together into that person's pain experience in that process. And that's really what we have found out, that when patients, we oftentimes hear the old category, you, you know, no pain, no gain, just push through it. What we are recognizing now is the importance of understanding, and you can understand how to get better. And really there is power in knowing and understanding, and that is really what we are finding can be so important. When people truly can start to understand these unique things that happen through the neurophysiology of what's happening in our bodies from a pain experience. And really what we've found for patients, this most important thing for them, is the important is knowing that pain does not always mean my body or my brain, it's not because you're crazy or something wrong with you, that they are not damaged. Oftentimes it's they're working too good. Your nervous system, your protective mode that you go into is just working a little bit too good. We have to retrain that system a little bit. We also are important to take home message of patients to understand all of the other factors, like I said, it's not just speeding that causes a car accident, right? It's all these other factors. It's not just your disc or your bad shoulder or your um, meniscus in your knee. It's your thoughts, your emotions, your experiences. All of these things put together are all a part of your brain trying to understand this experience. And is this something that I need to be protective with? So it's helping people understand that a little bit further. And the most important thing is giving that person a sense of hope. Your nervous system is this beautifully plastic system. It can be changed quicker than any other system you have in your body. And we can retrain those things through all sorts of different methods to get somebody back into a way. And why is this important? The reality is, is there are more people suffering from chronic and persistent pain in this world than those that suffer from heart disease, cancer, and diabetes combined, okay? We oftentimes think, well, those diseases you can die from we do recognize over 170 people a day are dying from pain medications. And no, they're not just the addicts, most likely they started in the healthcare system. So yes, chronic pain does unfortunately kill people and has a significant impact on so many people. Over 100 million people here in the US on a daily basis are suffering with some form of chronic and persistent pain. That's one out of four when you do the math. So the sense of giving them a sense of hope that these systems can be retrained is extremely important. So how do we retrain these things? 
A lot of it is we have to get the person healthy again. And when we say healthy again, it is in a big picture. We have to improve their lifestyles. That's things like their diet, quitting smoking, maybe getting into um, other things to improve their um, lifestyle and their well-being with where they live at. Improving their mood by decreasing stress and truly getting them to not think themselves as damaged goods anymore, but that they have an overprotective nervous system that can be retrained with these. Working on cognitive and emotional strategies by reframing things. There's my body just protecting me. It's not a body that's damaged that needs to be replaced or fixed. And obviously the importance of exercise and moving and getting back into daily activities again. And that's why when they understand that I'm sore, but I'm safe. I'm not causing further damage to my body. These things are important messages for patients to understand. Again, when we've gone through a good evaluation to ensure them that they're not causing continued damage, that they can exercise even though they're sore, that the hurt doesn't always mean that you're harming something, okay? And again, so that's why if we can get them the motion again, we say motion is lotion, and we can get them moving and doing it back into their activities. And again, using medications which can be helpful. All of these things are important for patients to understand that yes, pain is extremely complex. You may have had it for a long period of time, but there is hope that we can always retrain that nervous system by getting you back into life and providing health again. So hopefully today you've learned a little bit more that pain is complex. It may not have been always as straightforward as I thought. Some people can have pain and no injury, and you may have injury and no pain. It's never the same thing. But the good news is, is that it can be retrained and you can get back to a more fruitful life. Thank you.